Hello, reader. I'm Alex. I'm Kelly. And this is The The Lit Joy Joy Podcast. Podcast. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing author Monty J. Monty J is a dark romance author with titles published in multiple countries. Their books are for hopeless romantics with wicked hearts looking for their next morally gray hero. They call the Appalachian Mountains home, along with their two furry friends, Poe and Maeve. When they aren't writing, you can find them reading anything Stephen King in a tattooed chair or binging a new true crime documentary. Hello. Welcome to the Litjoy Podcast, Monty J. We are so excited to have you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am nervous, but I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> oh my gosh. No need to be nervous. No need to be nervous. But I know. we've been excited to talk with you since um, we've had Devin Ryan on. Yes. And she De- has... Do you, you know Devin, I, right? I, yeah. That is my girl. I love her. She's amazing. We've had her on a couple of times and she always wants to talk about your books and how much she loves them. And she has created this impact where um, all of our listeners, as well as internally, we have all been like, okay, we need to know more about this Hollow Boys series. What's yes. going on over here? And I adore her. Oh, yeah. She's a who. And I think you guys have had an interview together or you've done a live. Or yes. Anything? We did, uh, when I released The Blood We Crave Part 2, we did like a live on her Instagram. That was actually initially how I first met her. She tagged me on an Instagram story and I was like, who is this? Hello. Hi. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So then we just started talking on um, Instagram DMs and became quick friends. She is genuinely such a kind and giving human being. I love her to death. Oh, yeah. She's very kind. And I feel like such a good cheerleader for just people, readers, her community, and authors in mm-hmm. general. She just put so much positivity out there. So Yes, yeah, she's like a little ball of sunshine. I just want yeah. to bottle it up, like <laughs> put it on my belt. She's incredible. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm excited to get to know you a little bit more. So let's first jump in and talk about writing. When did okay. you know you wanted to become a writer? How did you get to become a writer? What was that that growth process like? So I like, I jokingly tell people that I've been a writer my entire life, even though I know I didn't come out of the womb with a pen. Um, but I, I jokingly say that. I think I fell in love with writing the way a lot of authors do through falling in love with reading first. And then it was kind of a gradual progression. I was always a big journaler. I had a lot of thoughts inside of my head, which then fell into like wanting to write fiction a little bit more. But I think a lot of it happened in middle school. Uh, I guess like those are like the formidable years of your life where you're like finding yourself. So middle school is when I started writing very, very poorly written poetry. And I was like, yeah, I'm definitely good at this. And then I look <laughs> back at them like, what are you doing? Um Um, And But I think it was my freshman year of high school that I thought to myself, maybe I could do this for a career because, like I said, I'd always loved reading. I loved the freedom that came from being able to to escape through fiction. Uh, Doing that through reading, I always thought, oh, my God, how incredible of a job would it be to do that for other people? Because reading has been such an escape for me. I would love nothing more than to give that to other people like out there. So, but I think freshman year of high school, I had this teacher who was, she was very strict, but she was, she, I don't think she liked me very much because I'm like a teacher's worst nightmare. I talk to a fucking wall. Um, so <laughs> I definitely was like a thorn in her side, but she gave us a writing prompt after we had read this short story called The Lady and the Tiger which is paraphrasing about a woman who falls in love with someone she's shut in and her dad, who is the king, makes him battle this tiger for her hand in marriage and it ends in a cliffhanger. And our job was to write the end of the story and we could write it from any perspective we wanted. And I wrote it from the perspective of the tiger, which is not extremely innovative, but in my brain, I was like, this is the most creative thing in the entire world. I'm going to write it from this tiger. Um, So I just wrote this little short story about this tiger who had been like taken from his family and he was like extremely traumatized. And then I ended my short story with another cliffhanger of him like walking out into the arena. So you don't see how it ended. And she told me, now this, mind you, this teacher up to this point was not very, I don't want to say not nice. She was just like, you know, one of those teachers where like you definitely weren't getting shit past her and she was not falling for any of my like bullshit. So 
she sat me down after class. She'd give me a hundred on the paper and she was like, you are very good at this. Like, I think that you might have a talent for this moving forward. And it was the first time that somebody had told me I was good at something I'd felt so secretly passionate about for so long that I was like, oh, so you mean to tell me that I really could do this? Like, this is not just like a little like joke that I keep to myself. Um, so I think that that was the moment that I really said I could I could be a writer if I like tried and applied myself and like went in that direction. So I think that was when I initially was like, I'll be an author. But I think I've always been a writer. Yes. Since- yeah. Well, and just to kind of echo your high school teacher, um, I I did find that this book was very well written. Um, and oftentimes in the romance genre, I feel like and maybe this is just my bias, but I do feel like there's a little bit more wiggle room for quality of writing because it's really like sex driven. Mm. Um, and and so I feel like you get a lot more just grammatical errors or sentence structure is kind of a hot mess or there's like too much speed or not enough speed in plot. And I found that structurally, the Hollow Boys were very well written. They very much, like, they they had an etiquette to them that was, like, a skilled writer. And I noticed that right away as I was reading them. So, I mean, she she was accurate. In- Thank you. I have a little bit of a thing with purple prose, which I think is what a lot of people <laughs> pick up on when yeah. I write. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I definitely have a bit of flowery with my words, uh, a little bit too much sometimes, but I'm getting better at it. I'm working with a like a bigger team of editors now moving forward. So they're very good at like being like, hey, MJ, you don't have to take seven pages to describe a plant. OK, they know what the plant looks like and you're fine. <laughs> I'm like, thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Sometimes I get carried away with adjectives and adverbs. Well, I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm like... Hey. Th- very good writing. I'm curious as to when you were a budding author and you started to get into writing more. Um, and I was relating so hard to the poetry. I was totally like, oh. I'm a poet. Like in junior high and high school, that was for sure how I like to express myself. And then I had a similar teacher in 10th grade that really encouraged my writing. And I started doing some, I liked pushing the boundaries. Uh, with writing yes. and I did the thing that you were never supposed to do like uh, there's like this unsaid rule that you never kill a dog I feel like in stories and yeah. I was all watch me you know like I I did I wanted to push those boundaries a little bit and do the opposite of what was uh, I don't know those unsaid rules and so I'm curious and that was just me just trying different genres and different you know different writing experiments kind of how I yeah. looked at it did you kind of know early on the genre that you wanted to write in or were you also very much exploring all genres? Um, I very much so know what my end game was. I tried to go into it you know, like knowing what I wanted to do beforehand because I knew that there was a huge learning curve and I was going to be hit with trial and error. So I needed to make sure that my foundation was solid So I had a plan from the beginning, and that was I originally wrote contemporary romance, like sports romance specifically, because this was unfamiliar territory to me. It's my first series, my first books. And I knew that sports was something I felt so comfortable with that I knew no matter what happened, I know hockey, so I'm going to be okay. So I started with that, but I always knew that I wanted to write like gothic romance, darker themes, and then eventually find myself into fantasy later in my career. But I know that I want to write darker themes. I knew that from the beginning. I just knew that going into it originally, I wanted to be comfortable first. I did shift my audience very quickly. (laughs) I finished like my hockey series and then I was like, hey, guess what's next? And they were like, what? Hello? (laughs) Um, I try to tell authors who, especially indie authors who are getting into it, that um, my advice to them is always never brand yourself around a genre or a trope. Brand yourself around your writing style and readers will follow you from your writing style. Like if you're branding yourself sports romance in the beginning and you decide one day you want to write, why choose dark romance? it'll be harder to transfer your audience. But if you brand around what you write and how you write it, people will fo- be more apt to follow you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. From my experience. Yeah. Yes. Great um, advice. That's, yeah, as Kelly said, amazing advice. And I also feel like there was an element in Hollow Boys 
where it felt magical realism, paranormal esque. Um, and I had that thought where I was like, I wonder if Monty's or MJ, is that what you go by, MJ? At- Either one is fine. Most yeah. people call me MJ, um, okay. but Monty's perfect. Okay. So I had that thought where I was like, this is this borders on paranormal because the hollow boys very much feel kind of like vampires like or yeah. like you know like they can come into a pool and then disappear and you're like how like it, there was these moments yes yeah yes. yes very much where it was like this is defying laws of physics a little bit and everybody's kind of on this this uh scary journey and that's where paranormal romance i feel like has that edge of horror to it because it truly is a monster and so that's very much how these boys felt are kind of like these monsters of some kind. And, yeah. and, and I'm like, I'm not surprised to hear that you're interested in more fantasy. Um, also, yeah. like, I'm thoroughly excited to dive <laughs> into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a, I have a half finished uh, manuscript for my fantasy trilogy that I want I'm working on. Um, behind the scenes of things. Um, fantasy has always been like something I wanted to get into. I feel like my writing style fits really well in the fantasy. I love a good world building. That's like my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, so I, I think my writing style would style would fit it. Um, but I also just have like a love for dark romance. So I'd like to try and balance both if possible. We'll see how that goes for me. But I mean, I want to say that it wasn't I mean, I'm not like a mastermind like Taylor Swift. Um, I <laughs> not intentionally was trying to lay out like paranormal ro- like moments, but I think it comes out unintentionally because of my writing style and also because of the themes that I was writing. I wanted them to feel like an aura, like more than a person. I wanted them to like, you want people to be kind of scared of the guys. So you need to like make them almost like have an energy about them that feels paranormal or mm-hmm. otherworldly. Like, they may actually buy you and drink your blood, but they won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think it was an unintentional, intentional, happy accident. I very much felt that exactly what you're saying now that you say it that way, that yeah. these boys just have this presence about them. And even when they're not there, you know, when Briar kept being like, I felt a presence, I'm like, yes, that's how I feel the whole time reading the book is there's yeah. this entity. And it did have very... um you know, Hades Persephone vibes. We've talked about that a little bit. And because I read a lot of, interesting enough, Hades Persephone. She loves that. I do. I love it. it. I read all kinds of that. (laughs) It's like my jam. (laughs) And so I read a lot of romances that are based on Hades Persephone. And I love that element about Hades having that air about him, that aura, as you call it. Yeah. So I'm like, thank you. That was perfect for putting words to it and mission accomplished. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate Um, it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm curious, what is your writing like process like? What kind of a writer are you in regards to how much you like to plot versus kind of, um, you know, as they call it, pants, You're just a pantser, you know, just fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah. Uh, what's your process like? I'm um, definitely not a pantser. <laughs> so you can ask anybody that knows me. I am a heavy, heavy plotter. Um, awesome. Like I have control issues. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm make- I have to make sure that everybody everybody's laid out. Um, my writing routine is very disorganized, but I'm an organized person in my brain. Mm. So I write at night majority of the time. Uh, I don't know really really know what uh, is up with that with my brain, but for some reason, words are easier at night. So I write at night. I don't write during the day. So while everybody is asleep, it's usually like 3 a.m. and I'm halfway done with what I need to be doing. And people are like, go to sleep. And I'm like, you want a book? I'm going to stay awake. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But my writing like process is very, very plot heavy. I will. I'm a character driven writer. I think I hate like saying things about myself because it's like, what if people don't agree with me? You know, like, what if I know you're not? <laughs> no, I mean, okay. you get to speak for you first before anybody else does. No matter how famous or successful you are, you still get to be the person who has the first opinion of yourself. So I'm like, I support that. Yep. Yes. I am the driver. I am a character driven writer. So a lot of my stories take place with characters first, like an idea of what a character is like. 
and then the idea of what their backstory looks like and then inklings of a plot and I'll pull those together. But I'll initially do character interviews and then I'll plot dump everything from beginning to end what I want to happen in the beginning, middle, and end. And then I'll take those elements and I'll put it in an outline. And I usually outline about 10 chapters at a time to leave room for a bit of a more organic flow. Like if I finish chapter 10 and I'm like, ooh, what if I did something like this in chapter 11? That would be so cool. So I allow my creativity to not feel so structured, but I do need a plan. I need to know like what I'm writing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or my brain's going to write craziness and it will not make sense. I also like to drop Easter eggs. So it's important for me to have an outline to like drop little nuggets here and there that make sense at the end. So I would say, yeah, I'm a heavy plotter and I admire every pantser in the world (laughs) because that could never be me. (laughs) Could not. I'm like, uh, you mentioned just when you were talking, you said you do a character interview. I was like, what is a character interview? That sounds awesome. Awesome. That I love care. My character interviews are my favorite, actually. So I have like um my friends shit on me so much for this, by the way. But <laughs> I have a character interview list of 147 questions of essentially like I sit down at my in my office and I basically imagine that I'm an interviewer and I am interviewing my character. Um, so the questions range from like, what's your full name? Do you have a nickname? Do you have scars? Do you believe in God? Do you Uh, all of these like different questions that you would ask a person that you were trying to get to know on a very deep level. And I essentially ask my characters this and I answer in the way that I think that they would answer. So like, for example, Alice, I distinctly remember asking him a question and I wrote like in parentheses, like he put his feet up on the table and he like Mm. stretched his arm back and he cleared his throat a lot and he had like really strong shoulders. So I'm just like building how they move, what their dialogue will look like, how they answer questions and their like diction throughout. And it's just a really good way for me to familiarize myself with their voice. Um, so that I feel like I can separate them from each boy. It I'm better at it with the females, making them feel more individualized. Um, their voices are clearer. But when you have a scary guy, it's hard to like section off the scary guys. They got to be yeah. scary for different reasons. So I wanted to make sure their voices were not similar, that they all had their own personalities and could stand on their own. So I do that with my character interviews. And I actually am putting them at the back of special editions that I'm doing so people will be able to see them because I keep them in a file with all of my little notes. Amazing. That's brilliant. I'm like, okay, so they call it like a dossier or dossier sheet. What is it? Yeah. And, but I, it is brilliant that you turn it into an interview because um, like Kelly and I like hobby, right? And I have like this fantasy series that, I started before Lit Joy and maybe I'll finish after Lit Joy. It's like just something I work on like a couple times a year. I'll just pull it out. And I have that spreadsheet. And sometimes it is it's so difficult to bring those characters to life. Like you yeah. feel like you're just answering questions for them and you feel so in your own head. That is such a good writing trick to literally pull them out and have them sit in front of you and ask them questions. That's so smart. It's, it's an incredible, I, I th- I'm i trying to think about where I originally, I'm, I got this from somebody. I found this on the internet. Somebody had mentioned doing character interviews. So I definitely am not the first person to think of it. Um, but I, I don't know, there was something so, I don't know, creative about the idea of like visualizing what they looked like. And I think it's such a neat little trick to figure out people's voices because you know, you write multiple characters in a book and the last thing that you want is for somebody to be like, oh, this is so flat because everybody sounds and feels the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a really neat little trick that I would recommend to any author or budding writer or just a hobby writer in general to get to know your characters. And also you get to know like, uh, it helps your plot too because you can find out things about your characters that could tie into pieces of your plot. Um, I did a lot of that with Lyra and Thatcher. There were so many like elements of their character interview that tied in directly to their plot line that I was like, this was, I'm so glad I decided to do these. This was great. Good good for me. That was good. Good job. (laughs) Yeah. Good job. I'm I'm, like so blown away. I'm like, genius. Like that's Mm -hmm. so brilliant. I know that like we've done that experiment or that practice or exercise uh, with business, right? Like we want to think through our demographic, what's the kind of customer that we have, the kind of customer we want. Yeah. And so we've walked down that path before. And I, as soon as you mentioned that, I was like, oh, oh, 
the potential that would have if I was writing, you know, mm -hmm. more consistently, um, would be incredible. And so it sounds like you are going to be sharing a lot of those questions in your those yeah. special editions, which that's where I'm like, can I, can I have those? I need those yeah. questions. I'll send you guys all, I have an, I have an, I send it to everybody. Anybody who asked me for the character interview questions, Same. there's 147 of them and I'll send it. them to whoever because it's super beneficial to all involved. <laughs> I love that because I can absolutely see how you can create those Easter eggs in advance, the little nuances. Uh, and yep. so I'm over here just like buzzing. I'm all, I want to try this. I want to practice this. I think oh, yeah. it's a great exercise uh, to just start writing. It, like, And it's fun when you are you have writer's block. It's my favorite yeah. thing to do when I have writer's block because um, it doesn't feel like writing, but it actually is. Like there's been yes. multiple times I've taken dialogue from character interviews and placed them in my books. So it's a great way of being like tricking your brain into thinking you're not writing, but you actually are. Um, so yeah, I will email you guys the questions. You guys can have them. Do with them what you will. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm <laughs> I'm like, I'm so excited. So um I there is definitely a horror element to your writing. Uh, exp well, in Hollow Boys, for sure. And um, we did a little research. You read horror growing up. That's a genre that you have experienced as a reader. Um, yeah. How did that kind of influence your writing process? Because I think that the leap between horror and romance is not always obvious, especially yeah. for, for new romance yeah. readers, I feel like. And so for tell sure. us kind of about that, how that informed your writing. Yeah. Um, so I don't read as much romance as I should even now. If I'm not writing, I'm usually reading like gothic fiction or horror. It's been like my favorite genre since I was young. Um, shout out R.L. Stein and Goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. Eventually <laughs> like holding into Stephen King, who is my idol. I would lay my life down for that man. Um, <laughs> But I think that it helped my writing because I really enjoy the idea of uh, like basic instincts in like human beings. There is something so primal about fear coupled with um, love because when you like strip away everything but fear, when you're afraid, the only thing you're thinking of is like with your basic instinct. That's like so much adrenaline. That's so much just endorphins running wild. and finding love in the scariest of places makes it almost feel more valuable, kind of like finding a diamond in like the darkness. There's something that makes love feel almost like an intangible, like a tangible object to characters who are experiencing scary moments or horrific moments. Um, and I think that makes it more beautiful to the reader because you think of love, like we, we say, I love you all the time, but it feels way more important when it's in times of like desperation or times of like, fear, um, mm -hmm. for example. So I think that just the way um, horror authors or gothic fiction authors like Mary Shelley and like Bram Stoker and Ray Bradbury are able to fold readers in with imagery really influenced the way that I wanted to write. I wanted people to be able to smell like rain and cobblestone and like feel cobwebs. I was always so obsessed with that growing up. Um, with the way that writers, authors were able to do that, I was like, I want to do that one day. I want somebody to read a book and be able to like smell where they are. Yeah. So I think that that's where the biggest influence came from was the imagery and the description of horror writing is incredible because they can't lean on things like scary music or like dun 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 in like yeah. horror yeah. movies to build that for yourself for themselves so that's that's probably what the biggest influence i took away from writing horror reading horror and reading gothic fiction was for me um yeah yeah so <laughs> that was a long-winded answer no, that i question. love that and you brought some really great points up yeah. like frankenstein and dracula like they they definitely i mean even mm -hmm. yeah like fahrenheit 451 there's yeah. love found in in the most like, unlikely of circumstances yeah like the most contentious or fearful circumstances there's like that romance element and that's such a good connection to pull through from like classic literature and people don't even get it most often but like you know, romance is a very common theme in horror novel in yeah. horror movies yeah. that nobody notices like the final girl always usually ends up with the final guy like they or you know vice versa like yeah. something of that is like um 
foundation, they have went through this extremely traumatic event of trying to survive this slasher that's running them down. And they've seen like the bare bones of each other through all of this. They've seen like anger and sadness and fear. And now at the end of it, they're like, we can't let, we trauma bonded. We can't let go anymore. Like we're in love at this point. So I mean, romance and horror have always gone hand in hand in my brain. I just don't think that people like notice it in the initials of like watching horror movies or reading novels. Um, yeah. But I think it is an extremely good example of that. Um, even though there, there's a, you know, the, the Losers Club, that friendship that bonded over in It by Stephen King. And then also the romance between Bev and Ben is also there. Stephen King writes one of the most incredible love poems I've ever read in my entire life in the scariest novel I've also read in my entire life. So I think that they all have always go hand in hand in my brain. Yes. Oh, this is so fascinating. I'm like, you're speaking to the right, like, to our, our lingo, I guess, because we both have undergrad in psychology and like mm-hmm. human behavior oh, I love that. is just something we are so fascinated by. And I am very interested in this topic because the more you're talking about it, the more I'm like, you're right. Oh my gosh, I've been missing yep. the connection. Um, so I love that you're bringing more light to this, um, the, the the mix of the genre, because it's totally true. We were just, this actually reminded me of our interview with Jay Kristoff, um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've read any of his stuff. I have, I have a I have a book on my shelf right now, Empire of the Vampire. Empire yeah. Of the Vampire. Um, he also w- like had a lot to say about Stephen King and his influence on his writing. Mm-hmm. And well, yeah, I, would, I was like, you guys should read each other's works if you haven't. <laughs> Just put yeah. that out there. You would thoroughly enjoy Jay's stuff. It's yeah. very dark and sexy. Um, oh, I loved Empire of the Vampire. Oh, it you read it already. Right? Okay, yes. Yes, um, absolutely incredible. And we did a special edition of his Nevernight trilogy, oh, and that yeah. was very dark and twisted. And in the first pa- the first chapter is 16-year-old Mia, and she is murdering and losing her virginity like every other page. Yeah. And so, like, she's committing her first murder. Yes. She's, like, go. committing her first murder and having sex for the first time. And it's this very interesting... Um, dichotomy that he just captures really beautifully. And mm-hmm. so I think that you two would vibe. Yeah, you'd yeah. vibe. Uh, I can't wait for this. Okay, what were you going to say? Uh, I, 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 I was just like, oh, if they haven't, they should read each other's works yes. as well because they both um, have talked so much about Stephen King and that influence yeah. and they have similar vibes. But uh, I was initially actually going to school for psychology. That's what I was. In oh, school yeah. For. Super cool. We are fascinated. And I think yeah. that's why I'm so drawn to something like we talk about this, like Wuthering Heights. I, mm. I'm all, it's toxic as fuck. Like it is toxic and I love it because yes. it is such yeah. a peek behind, you know, human behavior when it is not uh, prim and proper. Yeah. yeah exactly. And I wonder, and I'm like, you could categorize Wuthering Heights as like a psychological thriller. Yeah. And as like a dark romance. I feel like it could totally fall it into definitely those. definitely is a dark romance. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. sure. Yes. I mean, he's like, digging up her grave and laying in it, you know, yes. like it's almost like a ghost. And story. honestly, that is dedication. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> You're like, what a great, what a great person. You really loved her. What a great lover. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, in the, in the realm of dark romance, that's a green flag for the book boyfriend. <laughs> like digging up corpses. Yeah. Green flags. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I'm like, speaking of green and red flags, um, I want to talk specifically about The Lies We Steal because that's probably yeah. where, people, where people will jump into your work first. And yeah. so if we're introducing new readers, um, let's talk about The Lies We Steal, which is book one in the Hollow Boys series. So give us yes. like a quick pitch on it. This episode is brought to you by a collaboration that is near and dear to our hearts. It is the Willisay Bugu Alliance. We have partnered with this company, this nonprofit, that helps to provide resources to folks in Malay, Africa. And so we work with them specifically in their adult literacy program in Mali. So uh, for every dollar that our customers are donating, we are able to match that dollar and give back. And I want to talk a little bit about what this program provides and how we're specifically working with them. So at Willisay Bugu Alliance, They are committed to uplifting rural and impoverished regions of Mali, Africa. Over half of Mali's young adults ages 15 to 24 are not literate. And despite improvements since the inception of education programs in 1993, many villages 
don't continue their education past the fifth grade due to factors such as household poverty, child marriage or labor, and limited access to formal education. So in 2024, um, the Willisay Bugo Alliance invited their community to contribute to extending their adult literacy program in Mali, which would help the folks there to continue to learn how to read. Um, For example, many of them did not go to school or left school and did not learn how to read. And so now adults can go back and read. Um, What we found was that a lot of folks were interested in donating to building schools and helping children to read, but where they really needed extra support at Willisay Bugu was with adult literature. So as I mentioned before, LitJoy is matching customer donations dollar for dollar. We are contributing every dollar to the sustainability and expansion of their literacy programs and their courses there. It helps to pay teachers, it helps with supplies, uh, and it helps to subsidize so that folks can come and learn how to read. This effort empowers individuals in Mali, helps them overcome barriers, and build a brighter future. You can donate right now if you want to go and help with this this philanthropic effort at LitJoy, you can go to litjoycrate.com slash charity, C-H-A-R-I-T-Y. So make sure to head to litjoycrate.com slash charity and to place your donations. Oh, geez. I am. I wrote this whole thing. I'm really bad at talking about it, though. Um, <laughs> the, the Hollow Boys series is about four friends, four outcast boys who are sons of founding families of this very corrupt Macrob seaside town called Ponderosa Springs. And essentially it follows their plot line. One of the boys' girlfriend was died under mysterious circumstances. Mm. And they are like, no, she didn't. So they do their morally gray investigation. And I say morally gray because none of it's legal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it follows the stories of them getting justice for their best friend's girlfriend. Uh, while also falling in love. And so we start the story off with The Lies We Steal, which is about Alistair Caldwell, who his father owns the majority of Ponderosa Springs, but money can hide a wealth of secrets. And he's grown up in a very, very traumatic household. And he meets Briar Lau, who is a new girl in Ponderosa Springs um, and has no idea what she signed herself up for. And she happens to witness some debauchery in the woods and now she's a witness to a crime and Alistair and Briar's story kind of intervene at that point. And it's their journey of finding love while also getting justice for somebody that they care very deeply about. That is my pitch. That was a great, a great. pitch. Oh, <laughs> also, it's so much darker than your pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the pitch is accurate and it's there's some twisty stuff in here for sure, which just keeps you wanting to turn the page, you know? Mm-hmm. It definitely, I have trigger warnings at the beginning for the dark. (laughs) So like people can um, figure out the darkness level at the opening of the page when they see the trigger warning, but it is very dark, I would say, in my opinion, Yeah, in my opinion. Yes. I'm like, what would you give the darkness rating? So we can kind of, there's like dark romance. So there's a scale of like dark, very dark, and I'm so dark, I'm dead. (laughs) Um, I don't know if it's. I mean, I think it depends on what you view as dark, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there is some dark stuff in books, like dark in the subject of, like, sexual sense, right? Where I'm like, whoa, dark, I'm dead. (laughs) Dark, I'm dead. Okay. Um, But I would say for this, in the sexual aspect, it's not necessarily extremely dark. Right. But in the subject matter, I would say so dark, I'm nearly dead like you need to right. resurrect me right so um, there's there is just like some graphic murder like the content the violence yeah. yes but i would say that um on the spice level it's probably like a three or four spice mm. yeah I would say three. how would you three. Yeah, say, how would you rate it okay the three. chili pepper is subjective everybody because it depends on like what you read you know like right, if right, you're right. reading like, erotic fiction every day which is fine pop off girly yeah yeah and then you come to mine am i still the the chili pepper scale might be a little bit less but if you're reading something of like really contemporary maybe closed door romance mine is probably going to be five yeah um but i think my books are very plot heavy but when the my readers say that when the spice does hit it spices so know that what you do get is spicy yeah yes 
That's very accurate, I would say, for as a new reader to the genre, yeah. in a sense. I've only read a couple of the dark romance stuff before. Yeah. And I I really appreciated that it was plot heavy. It's because when those yeah. spice moments hit, I feel like they just hit so much like stronger. Yeah. Cause I care about the characters. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, Cause I've absolutely read a few where I was like, I literally don't care about any of these characters. So it's not as yeah. it didn't work for me in that regard. And yeah. Cause I think there's people out there who just enjoy, they enjoy it for what it is. And and I just know for me, I need, I need some character depth there. Yeah. And so I really appreciated that. It's so, it is interesting to read these different subgenres within romance. You know, Alex and I have definitely been exploring them and trying out new ones because romance has just really hit the scene in the I last year. I love this year. journey for you too. I, I love am loving it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it is interesting because it brings up certain things that you kind of have to ask yourself like, okay, this is like, let's say, and the spiciness of this, it's like working for me. And then you have these moments of yeah. like, oh, do I know myself? Like, uh, uh, is this something I'm into? Like, it is so fascinating <laughs> that it will start to generate all these questions about my sexuality. And I think that's it's really- like, do I like this? For real. No. Yes. yes? Kind of. Maybe. I, I, I know. Do. Well, sometimes yeah. I'll be, I found yeah. myself um, in The Lies We Steal being like, this is sexually relevant. Also- <laughs> Also, red flags. Red flags. Like, I have like because I have done so much work in psychology and mental oh, yeah. health and self awareness, and um, I'm like also somebody needs to save all these children from themselves, right? Like, I, like you totally all, have that for absolutely. sure. They all need it for sure. Yeah, which is just it's so interesting. But I'm like, what is what do you find is the feedback from readers? Yeah. Do you have any like favorite? comments or questions that you've received from readers about specifically the content um i'm trying to think. um i i my one of my favorite reviews is somebody said if smut and stephen king had a baby this would be it and i said thank you so much i printed it off and i put it on my wall <laughs> yes. oh, that's awesome so, <laughs> I mean, I like, and some people call me Scary Spice, which I thought was really funny. And I thought that was cute. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm a Spice Girl. How cool. Um, but I mean, for like the content, a lot of the times what I get is um, I take a lot of time to make, I'm aware that every single one of these characters needs extensive cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. Very much. Okay. Um, <laughs> but on also coupled with that, I take a lot of time to do a lot of research to make sure that the mental health that I'm representing is represented accurately. I myself struggle with mental health. So I want to make sure that nobody's being harmed in these depictions. So a lot of the times the feedback that I get is like, I related so much to this character's trauma. I related so much to this character's journey. And for me, that's like the most rewarding thing that somebody can say to me, mm -hmm. because to say that I've written a character that somebody has recognize themselves in in such a hard time is such a beautiful yet sad thing to relate to somebody to like I'm so terribly sorry that you have to relate to that but I'm really glad that you found solstice between the pages of like reading your own journey essentially so that's most of the feedback that I get definitely get some people who are like they need help and I'm like yep they do <laughs> but that's for like a that's a prequel like a that's a book later on yeah. that happens. Uh, that I don't write about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Later. Um, but writing characters with mental health and lots of trauma and is something that I, I don't want to say I'm known for, but something I do often because there's something about tragic backstories that really just pull me in every time. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. I get it. I'm like uh, probably all of our favorite characters. Yeah. Like a, a character has to have tragic backstory, I think, to have the emotional hit. And, yeah, you know, that you want to root for them no matter how morally gray, right? Exactly. Well, that's that's the that's the line, right? It's yeah. like you want the reason you feel sorry for the villain is because something tragic happened to them. If nothing tragic happens to them, it's hard for you to tip your morally gray scale into the category of I feel sorry for you. If you're just like a good person who does bad things, people are like, wait. Wait, no, I don't know if I am with you on this one. But if you relate to the villain in some way, then it's easier for a reader to get behind rallying with the villain. Uh, so I think tragic backstories are sometimes necessary to the growth of the morally gray hero. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. And that's where I'm like, if everyone was, you know, 
healed and enlightened, it wouldn't be that intriguing. It wouldn't be fiction. It, it would just be, be really boring. Yeah. I was like, this wouldn't work, right? And- I mean, I think also their trauma is the reason that they're able to bond the way they do. Yeah. The Hollow Boys, minus Silas, who is my little, I love him. That's my sweet baby. Um, <laughs> minus Silas. The other Hollow Boys have never really experienced love before. Like they, Alistair and Thatcher especially, they have never really like, they did not grow up in homes where they were like, oh my God, I, like, I love you so much. You're so great. You're my son and I love you and I adore you. And you're, they did not grow up in houses like that. So how do you expect somebody, a guy who has never experienced love or kindness in that regard in the way that in a romantic relationship is framed, how do you expect him to know what the hell to do when he's faced with feelings? He doesn't know what to do. He's like, I've never done this before. I'm unsure of how to go about it. Um, so, I mean, it's, I think it's a, it's one of my favorite things about writing people like this is watching them discover for themselves what love means to them and how they are able to show that love to the character, to the opposing character across from them. So that's like the funnest part of writing morally great heroes, in my opinion. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. I'm just like, yep. I was like, tie a bow on it. So I literally was like, tie the bow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love this. This is amazing conversation because it's really just putting words to how I felt about it. Um, yeah, it was one of those like I finished it and I was like, how do I feel? <laughs> because like, I, this was dubious content and he's a little unhinged, but like also, but also I felt like so I felt for them exactly like you were saying it was perfect yeah. because it was never modeled to them. Like love was this foreign concept that was never modeled. So how are they to experience it? Um, and so it exactly. does it has this like virgin like feel of of them experiencing yeah. love for the first time, you know. Not in the other areas. Which I think is the most beautiful thing in the whole world. Yeah. It makes it more in it makes it more impactful for the readers because it doesn't feel like it's something that happens every day for them. It's like their very first experience with mm-hmm. love and you're wa- you're reading it, you're watching it as a reader, I guess, or reading it as a reader. Yeah. I think is how that would be said. Um, mm-hmm. and you're like, Oh my gosh, uh, you are experiencing love for the first time. How exciting. Which is why readers I, my favorite thing that readers say is that um, their favorite micro trope is when like the unfeeling morally gray hero is like, what is this feeling that's happening inside of me? And they're like, oh my God, that's my favorite micro trope. I'm like, me too. That's also my favorite micro trope. Do you have any um, favorite characters in other books, ones you did not write, um, that are either your favorite villain or your favorite morally gray character that um, you just like gravitate towards? They're like your favorite. Yeah. Oh, question. no. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to think. I mean, there's a lot. I have an I can fix him complex when it comes to fictional characters. Not in my real life. I went through therapy. No, <laughs> I literally told Kelly on the way down. I was like, there's always the, I was I was talking about how your books have that I can fix him element oh, yeah. in them. Yeah. And I and we were talking about that that kind of trope. Um, but tell me more like sorry, you can answer my question now. But I was like, I, I yeah. echo that and yep, I yep. hear you. Yes. I um so it's on this is only for fictional fictional characters by the way um somebody who I think is morally gray that villain that I love um Patrick Bateman I think was like (laughs) Patrick Bateman was the first one that I was like I realize what this like because it's it's fake he doesn't act spoiler alert he doesn't actually do any of it he just thinks about it um so I was like there's something about you that's interesting to me. Um, for a long time, I mean, I hate Darth Vader, but Anakin Skywalker had my heart for a very, very long time. Yes. <laughs> I think that that's another one that I would say, like, morally gray. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, book people besides Patrick Bateman from American Psycho that I am like, oh, this is, like, the morally gray hero of my life. There are definitely some. It just cannot think of any right now. I can't think of any books. I'm looking at my shelf and I'm like, where are you? And I I cannot find any that I'm thinking of right now. So I I can't. There's like such a, that micro trope right there is actually just like an entire genre, right? It's like Draco, it's Christian Grey. It's like all of the mainstream bad boy. Like there's always this element of her magical 
vagina can fix them with love, right? Like it's yep. such an interesting and can fix them. It, and it's like it happens over and over again in literature. Yep. So obviously people are drawn. Something that I thought was really important that I find really important in my writing that I try to make a continuation, like a continual theme throughout the the Hollow Boys especially is that love does not change their trauma. It does not change who they are necessarily. It's just something that they experience. Like um, people, that's one harp that I get often is that the Hollow Boys don't say I love you. Uh, Silas says it and Rook says it, but Thatcher and Alistair don't say I love you. Um, and to me, that was really important for his char- their characters specifically, because like I said, they have never experienced it before. And to them, words mean everything. So why would they say something they don't know anything about? They need to take time to like really understand it before they can use that word for somebody. And so Briar and Lyra and the girls opposite of them love them to the point of like, I know what I know that this is love, but you don't. And we'll take the time for you to understand what that means for you. But it doesn't change the fact that Alistair still has issues. And yeah. so does Thatcher and so does Brooke and so does Silas. And that'll always stay there with them until they work through that with their own therapists. But it doesn't change their nature per yeah, se. They're still point. they're still like scary guys who do shady shit. So <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Loved it like for me, I just don't think that love is like a magic wand that you're like, everything about your life is now fixed because we are in love. Unfortunately, no. But I love the idea. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good way to put that. Great point, too. Uh, I think I fell into that category for sure in high school of like, even if it was subconscious, like, I can fix him or I can make the difference. We all did. I'm like, what's mm-hmm. that about? Like, you know, there's just something there. I think it you know, and I'm really digging down, there's, there's gotta be ego in it. Right. In feeling special that maybe I'm yes. the only one mm-hmm. that could have this impact, yeah. you know, cause I've, I heard, you know, the different boys I dated that they would use those terms. Like I've yeah. never opened up like this to somebody before, you know, yeah. it feeds that ego. And I'm yeah. just like, well, fancy me. Like, yeah. Well, it is. So, I read this paper once long, long time ago that talked about the psychology of young girls and the I can fix him complex being that when we were younger and somebody said to you, how do you know a boy likes you? It's when he's mean to you, right? And you were told that so often when you were little that you internalized that as you got older. So these toxic relationships where these guys maybe don't treat you the best, you think to yourself in the back of your head, I can fix him because he loves me because he's mean to me. And there was like this mm-hmm. whole psychology behind it. There's an entire paper that like tied this, maybe this internalization of these being told this as younger children internalized into, and I can fix him complex as we got older. And I said, now in my head, that makes sense. <laughs> like it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. So that could also be something that has to do with it. But I also think it's coupled with wanting to feel special. We all yeah. want to feel unique and that we have our own experiences in this world. Um, until you get older and you realize you've never had an original experience. And <laughs> I know. Um, shout it's out sobering. to the for telling me that. <laughs> um, every, everybody wants to feel special. Yeah. So in those like moments where it's like this mean guy who's mean to everybody and they don't like anyone, but they like you. And that makes you feel special. So, yeah. It's interesting. I think there's a an, uh, an interesting element to of um, cultural upbringing here where yeah. um, men uh, were just typically not encouraged to express or feel or not express emotion uh, except yeah. for anger, right? Like anger and aggression was this appropriate expression of emotion. And um, and women were taught very much the opposite, I feel like, um, for many, many years and in Western culture, probably yeah. globally. But it, I think that we had that experience growing up in a pretty conservative culture. Um, and even when I was in Seattle, I feel like it was just this idea of um, like, of course, if you listen to a, a boy who has never felt like anyone's really listened to his emotions and he's feeling big emotions for you, 
Uh, yeah. It feels like special, but it is a different form of trauma bonding, right? Like, yes. it, And so it feels so special, but it's just because you might have just been the first one to listen yeah. to and validate that he had emotion. And so I think that Kelly and I had that similar experience with boyfriends over and over again that they were like, "I, you're just different. And I think it was more just we were present and aware of their emotions and reflecting yeah. them back to them, um, yeah. which can be an interesting element, too. Yeah, like, what is this strange and unusual thing that I'm feeling? Yes. Because men often feel like they have two big, but my therapist tells me this all the time. They have two big boxes, anger and happy. That's it. And there are all of their emotions are shifted in between those two things. So like despair, embarrassment, sadness, so like all of those, the many emotions that we feel are all thrown into the anger box. Um, and then there's just happy over here in the corner. Um, <laughs> like, happy yeah, in the yeah. box. <laughs> I, I know happy in the box over here. So, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that that also has something to do with it as well. Um, it's interesting to explore that, too, through the genre of romance and, and yeah. dark romance. Because, as Kelly mentioned in the beginning, you start to ask questions. So, it's not just about the spiciness. But you start to ask, like, oh, like, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. And you're like, why am I so uncomfortable with this? And then, like, why does this feel familiar? So it's an interesting kind or like, of... like, why am I not uncomfortable with this? Yes. <laughs> you know, why am I, <laughs> like, really drawn to this? Like, that's yeah. what I think the the different subgenres and romance has really done for me. It has yeah. helped me kind of tune in to different things that I just wouldn't have explored otherwise. Yeah. Um, because for me, like, the Hollow Boys, the way I summed it up is I think that there is some kinkiness, you know, in it. Yeah. And, and the kinkiness is like, okay, if it's working for you. You don't need to necessarily go to the same lengths by any means, but okay, yeah. that's the note I'm going to take is maybe I should explore that if this is working well for me. And maybe it's only in reading that I enjoy it. Who knows? As well, that's the thing with fiction is yeah. like the I can fix him guys are never the guys you end up with. Like I know, those right. are the guys who really need therapy. But in fiction, you're able to kind of relive. I want to say it's like that first love experience that yeah. talks to first heartbreak that really fucked everybody up you get to relive <laughs> that you know in a in a nature where there's a happily ever after so you get to have your fantasy happily ever after in a in a fictional reality because like in real life these guys they have beer guts and their leather jackets don't fit anymore and they have a smoking problem so yeah I, I'm delighted I mean, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's a perfect way to describe it. <laughs> we leave them between the pages and we have our happily ever afters in our brains. Yep. Perfect. I'm like, that makes so much sense. <laughs> um, so we're kind of running long on the episode and I want to make sure we get a couple last questions in. I'm going to ask this one because I am curious okay, about perfect. the announcement that you put up the other day about oh, yes. your new book, Wrath of Exile. Yeah, right. Wrath of an Exile is the first book in the Hollow Boys Next Generation series. It's called The River Sticks Heathens. So the entire series is framed around the Hollow Boys children. Um, Amazing. They procreate. Oh, wow. They, okay. They procreated, <laughs> um, which has been a bit of a struggle for me because you have to make the parents likable and the parents have been through therapy and they have grown. So now I have children who are fine with like their parents, which has been weird, but uh -huh. um, it's been different for me. But essentially it follows Lyra and Thatcher don't have children. I've gotten so many questions about that and why that it is. But Lyra and Thatcher don't have children, but everybody else does. And the series will follow all of their children. Wrath of an Exile is about Serafina Van Doren, who is Rook and Sage's middle daughter. And then Easton Sinclair's oldest son and only son, Jude Sinclair, and for those of you who have not read the Hollow Boys series, Easton is a bit of a villain in the Hollow Boys. So it's a bit of a Romeo and Juliet moment. Um, okay. Their parents don't like each other. They're not supposed to be together. So um, I'm nice. really excited. I love this book with my whole heart. I love a good retelling and they were a really beautiful experience. So I'm really excited for people to read it. Yay. Okay, perfect. And we'll put links to that yeah. in um, the show notes too. Would you say perfect. that the like content and spice rating is really similar to the original series of the hollow boys. I would say I bumped my spice up a bit and my darkness has remained. So there, I just, okay. I made them equally matched now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm like, yes, excited about this. <laughs> We're both over here. Like, yeah. Amazing. Okay. okay. 
So final questions. We kind of ask all authors these questions. First up, what are you reading right now? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I'm not I'm not reading. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm not reading anything right now, actually. Okay. Um, so I'm in the middle of a deadline um, and trying to get ahead of schedule. So I'm not reading anything right now. But I, the last book I did read, though, was Romance, Go Me. And it was... <laughs> And I just forgot the title. It's by Ian Finley and Saxon James. It's a part, it's their most recent book in their Puck Boy series. Yes. They're all male, male romances in the hockey world. And I have loved this series since book one. So I just read the newest one. It was like Romantic Puck Boy. I think Ooh, that's what it nice. is. Nice. <laughs> I cried a little bit because it was so beautiful. But they're all like male male hockey romances, and it's an incredible series. If you guys like male male hockey romance, that's the most recent thing I've read. Nice. Okay. Um, that kind of leads into question two. When you say you're not reading right now, what are you working on right now? I am currently working on the girlies are going to eat me up for this, but I um, am currently working on Whisper of a Shadow, which is book two in the River Six Heathen series, um, which will follow. I'm not going to say that. Yeah, but it'll like yeah another. It'll follow another um, next-gen character that you'll find out about in Wrath of an Exile by the time it comes out. So I'm working on that second book right now. Perfect. Oh, that sounds amazing. And okay. You want my last one? Yeah, go for well, it. Well, where can readers find you online? How they can how can they connect with you? Um, I love it when people reach out to me. I am most frequently active on Instagram. Uh, you can find me at author.montyj um, on any platform. You can find my website at that, my TikTok and my Instagram. But like I said, I'm most e like frequent on uh, Instagram. So just DM me. It takes me a minute because I'm socially media like a, like. I try to put it away from myself because if not, I'll get too sucked in. But I will reach out. If you reach out, I will hit you back and like talk. I love talking to readers. So nice, reach out, perfect. talk to me. I'm a very nice person. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I can attest to that. This has been a lovely interview. Yeah. Seriously. Thank you. I it. Thank you so much for coming, for doing this interview. And um, we'll make sure that everybody has the links to find your work. Yeah. Thank you so much, Moni. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's been really incredible and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, reader, for listening to this episode of the Liquid Podcast. Please remember to rate and review us. And like a good book, recommend us to your friends.